Hi, everyone. Uh, Carmen Bowman here with the grant uh, to bring culture change to Wyoming. It's really been my honor to get to do that. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm just going to toss out every idea I've pretty much ever heard on uh, ideas for engaging families. And I know you all have great ideas as well. And I've allowed for more time to chat and talk this time. So if you you know, have something to add, we have time for you to just raise your hand or interrupt me, <laughs> please. It's okay. And time at the end. So uh, love this stuff. Thank you for doing this with me. Um, and as you know, I base a lot of what we do uh, on the Artifacts of Culture Change tool. Hopefully you're all quite familiar with it by now. Uh, if you're not, uh, you can just look it up, the Artifacts of Culture Change 2.0. And um, in the 2.0 version, guess what? We added, uh, there's a section called Family and Community. And one of the family-related culture change practices is the idea of a family council. So I'm curious if any of you do have a family council or have had one ever in the past. And um, one of the teams I got to work with, Star Valley, started one probably a year ago. And I asked them if they would come tell us about it. And guess what they said? <laughs> They're having a hard time getting people to come. But that doesn't mean it's every group, every community. Um, and I know we have some resurgence of COVID at the moment, but thank God that's not going to be as bad as it once was. So would love for you just to hear about this idea, uh, a family council. Notice the language matches resident council. Another practice is employee council. And I don't know, in my little mind, I just feel like, hey, that makes sense. It might be something to consider, seeing if people would come to it. And, and then, you know, if you think of the term council, in my mind, it really implies that this group has some, an element of power, <laughs> you know, if they're going to be a council, they're going to maybe decide some things. And if you ever wanted to, you know, get a council going on the, on the right footing, I guess would be my opinion. It would be to give them some power, give them some things to decide right? We all love that. Come to the meeting and you get to decide, you know, if you're on a board of some sort, Brittany, we joke a lot about if there's only a few of us on the, on the Wyoming culture change coalition meeting. Okay. We'll make some decisions, you know? Um, let's see. So uh, other thoughts uh, from me to you, and then I'd love to hear more from you. Um, maybe another thought that I've heard that I think I would try is to see if, if you can turn it into more of a support group. We don't usually use that lingo, support group, but having a, someone you love live in a nursing home can be hard, right? Like you as a family member have something in common with other family members that this is a hard position sometimes to be in. Um, so maybe that, and then I think we've all tried this uh, education, perhaps that seems really helpful to families. By the way, <laughs> I do a lot of training on validation methods when when we're getting to love people with dementia, and a lot of family members really appreciate that kind of hands-on, give me something to work with kind of education. Uh, or I would vote also for giving people ideas on how to. Come and spend time very meaningfully. You know, I hate it. Don't you hate it? When you sometimes see a family member, you know, sit with so-and-so, talk about the weather, talk about lunch, and sometimes look at their watch, right? Kind of implying, well, I visited mom today. Check, you know? And no offense to anyone. I just would love to somehow change that, right? To help people realize it could be so much more than check i visited mom uh and I, like i have some more ideas coming but one time um i saw a man who came to see his wife living in the nursing home she was not all that able to do a lot but together as a couple they had a volunteer job imagine that Brittany, life care of casper this past year did a lot with volunteerism 
And it was so special that the couple was known for, they're the ones that always set up like communion or something, okay? So notice it's, it's more than a visit and a check mark when we can create life for people. And I, again, I have more on that coming. And then when you say you got to serve really good food, <laughs> then maybe, maybe you get people there. So I'd love to hear from you all. Um, what other things have worked or not worked for family council? Uh, Joanne, you said you too worked at Life Care of Casper, it sounds like. And, but only one family came. <laughs> of course, only one family came. Uh, Shani, have you ever done it? Brittany, Julie? We haven't. Okay. Uh, Brittany, did any, you started it at Life Care, but then you, then you took a different job, right? Uh, we started talking about it before I left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. I mean, uh, Life Care of Casper has some really, really super active families. Mm -hmm. Um, but none that were super interested in doing like a family council. Okay. Um, and I don't know if that was a, um, I think that's a little bit of hesitancy on the on the the organization side and a little bit of he hesitancy on the the family side, mm -hmm. the organization because you know everybody knows the stigma. Oh my God, we don't want them all to come and yell at us at the same time, right? Um, mm -hmm. And and for the families, I think uh, a lot of them had the stigma that um, if we go and and an issue comes up and we side, you know, and we say things to the to the to life care about, you know, well, my mom's not getting this and everybody else, all the other families side together, is there going to be uh, retaliation? Is it a safe place, you know, to bring up those, those yep. concerns and not yep. alienate the staff? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well said. Well, I'm taking notes, everybody. So let's just be honest. If you're going to have a family council, you got to really live up to it. And that takes leadership and, and it can be done. And to be honest, I would still recommend it because wouldn't you rather have families telling you what's not right in family council than running to or calling the ombudsman or the state surveyors, right? Or the newspaper. So thank you for being honest. Um, oh, Julie, you're from Legacy as well. Um, let's see. You tried one in 2017. It just wasn't structured well. And it was just a few people showing up to complain about things. Well, I'm just going to say that again for all of you. Oh, maybe it's on my next slide, actually. Watch this. Watch this. Yeah. I'd love to tackle that. You know, um, in this beautiful business of people and taking care of people and taking care of other people's mothers and fathers and grandparents, you know, it, it's hard, right? And the in, I blame the institutional model, the institutional culture that we sort of, we sort of pit each other against each other, you know, like, like resident council seems like the same two people come and do what? Complain. The same people come to family council and do what? complain are they really complaining or could we look at it differently we're supposed to do quality assurance all the time right and so in my mind you want to know what people are thinking and and here's another way to maybe view it and and bring to your team and your community uh we turned it into another artifact um the home actively solicits the views of family members see and treats them as care partners instead of visitors in working together to accommodate the residents' preferences. So just think for a minute, what could you do different to, to create a culture where we work together? Uh, families are not difficult families. Families are not the enemy, right? We want families to come. We want them to come to us with whatever's wrong. You're going to go much further to say, hey, how's everything really going? Then to avoid it, right? Um, and then what is a care partner? This comes to us from the Eden Alternative. They changed this language many years ago. K 
care partnership actually implies a balance of care. Opportunities to give as well as receive care are abundant and experienced by everyone in the care relationship. Instead of giving care, someone partners in care. I just love that. You know, this family has known this older person a lot longer than we have, right? They deserve a lot of credit. Um, now, I'm going to also bring up when when we could maybe give them too much power. I realize that can happen, but I, I put the blame on us regarding that. So just something to think about, that your partner is in, in this person's care. Um, the word partner is quite nice, I think. It really implies a balance and equality. Uh, the Eden alternative keeps going, and they refer to elder care partners, family care partners, and employee care partners. We're all partners, we're all equal, and we're all for each other. Isn't that lovely? You could grab that word and bring it to your culture, bring it to your team, bring it to your community, make a few handouts, you know? Um, and then this kind of fits what we're talking about as well. Um, I highly recommend this book called Forget Memory by Anne Bassing. And she's out of Wisconsin. She's a professor and she's well-known uh, gerontologist. Uh, does a lot with performing arts, bringing performing arts to people living in nursing homes to be a part of it. Um, but she also has done many think tanks on re really rethinking things in the nursing home. I got to be a part of a think tank on reimagining activities in long-term care. And I found her book and read it. Oh, I've also interviewed her on my monthly webinar that I do. And, and oh, this is so good, I think. She says, don't think of family members as visitors. And we just read that again up above, right? Care partners instead of just visitors. And she says, help this older person to re-knit uh, the people in their life, <laughs> in their life and vice versa, the family members. Help them to re-knit this person who now lives in the nursing home where you work back into their life. So not a visit, but living life together. And I, the, the, the example that comes to my mind, I'd love to know you, yours. Let's say a woman was going to go home and paint her nails. Well, why doesn't she do it at the nursing home instead with mom, with grandma, or, you know, maybe not even their nails, but she does it wrong. I know it sounds funny, but there are some things that a person could do that they're going to do anyway, and they do it with mom or with dad when they're together. Wouldn't that be great if we got people to re-knit one another back into their life, not just a visit? And then she also brings up this crazy thing about how we have somehow made cognition um, kind of a standard of who we are, right? the dementia patient, the Alzheimer's resident, the uh, confused person, right? And she says, forget it. That's, that's why she calls it, forget memory. Forget about it, guys. Who cares if you remember or not? She's kind of going after that idea that a lot of family members actually do, no offense to family, but they know things like, mom, don't you remember when we went to Hawaii? mom don't you remember don't you remember don't you remember in fact in this book a, a husband admits that he wasted three years of his life and his wife's life by being focused on don't you remember and i really appreciate that how about you i personally don't remember a lot of things it's it's a bummer i have not never had a really great memory it's just true. And I'm also not trying to like live in it. Like some, I'll say, tell me more, remind me how that went, my husband. And once he starts talking about something, oftentimes I start to remember, which I really appreciate. Um, but the point here is don't worry about that. Be in the moment, live life together, remit people into your life. Um, and help create better lives, particularly with the people with dementia. Um, and Patrick Kossel is in your state, Wyoming. He's at Bighorn in Sheridan. 
He is in a culture change coaching project with me, and he has done a great job of inviting a person who lives at Bighorn to be a part of our calls and their culture change efforts. And his name is Joe. And what we've all seen happen here is a budding friendship, administrator and a leader uh, resident. Um, I don't love that language, but a person who lives there, who's also in, in leadership now, he's on this committee. And we were talking about the seven domains of well-being. That's a whole other topic. The Eden Alternative has identified the seven domains of well-being. And one of them is joy. And one day, I asked Joe on a call, Joe, what brings you joy? And you know what he said? He said, being a part of this. It's much better than sitting in my room by myself. So uh, they, they've they also become closer, Patrick and Joe, a friendship. And and I, I realized, like, one day on a call, I said, Patrick, do you see what's happening? You actually have what we used to call like a sage, right? An older person in your life to give you wisdom and to help you and encourage you. And so I just want to put that out there. You, each of you could identify a sage in your life or even in the nursing home where you work, that that's a special person to you and you lean into them and you ask them for help or advice or their wisdom. Guess what? It's not HIPAA protected. <laughs> Let's rejoice, right? That something is not HIPAA protected. You go get a stage for your life, okay? And encourage your teammates to do the same. Now, this whole notion of difficult family member drives me crazy. Anybody else, you know? So let's poke fun at it, right? Have you ever done this? Oh, there she comes, the difficult family member, duck. And, and we duck and we hide. And we say, has she gone by yet? Is she down the hall yet? isn't that pathetic you know i've come to realize from leaders in the culture change movement when we want to know what all family members think we do you got to guys you got to somehow embrace it go run after it run up to them instead of avoid them now you might not want to say hey difficult family member right <laughs> i'm just joking but you know i think it goes far to say hey i know things went bad yesterday I know yesterday was terrible. Like, just say it, own up to it. How are things going today? Are we doing better? Whatever the issue is. And then think of that person, not as a complainer, but as an informant. We're supposed to do our own quality assurance and improve performance all the time. That's how you're going to do that, by knowing what people think. Again, uh, viewing them in a partnership role, uh, being honest, not hiding anything. <laughs> Who has time to hide or lie about things, right? Um, be proactive. Uh, be be willing to hear hard news. Why not? Um, and then another thought that I've learned actually through the years is, uh, you know, think of all the learning that you have to do and I have to do in this field. And we tend to learn things before family members ever do, like they're not working in this field, right? So think of how we've had to undo using restraint, <laughs> undo using alarm. So I have realized in this beautiful business, we all signed up to be educators without maybe realizing it. We're always educating someone else, our team, our teammates, ourselves, and maybe the people who live there and certainly their family members. So a speech therapist friend of mine would say it like this, give families knowledge. They don't sometimes have it. Uh, and I've also changed that to say gift, gift families with knowledge. Um, and would you agree, most family members are dealing with guilt on some level. And so I, I say, I recommend you, you imagine like a blinking light, guilt, guilt, guilt in people's poor heads, you know, and realize it, it's very normal to feel guilty. And perhaps a lot of what they're saying that looks like difficult or complaining comes from a place of not feeling good about themselves, right? Sometimes you become the scapegoat, which 
kind of makes sense if you peel back the onion, as they say. Um, my favorite example is this. Have any of you, <laughs> oh, have any of you ever had a family member say this? Ready? Brittany, take my mom to every activity, whether she wants to go or not. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> What'd you say, Brittany? The number of arguments I have had, especially as, as a life enrichment coordinator, the number of arguments I have had with family members, and they have the best intention, I understand, but I cannot drag your mom kicking and screaming down yes. the hallway to bingo nope. or parcheesi nope. or bridge because she right. doesn't want to go. And I'm not going to do like right. me dragging her to that isn't going to help your situation. She's not going to be less depressed because I've made her go to something. Yeah, that's right. So my point exactly, when we say take my mom to everything, it's really saying because I feel so guilty, do something with her, get her out of her room, get her to do something. And then my guilt will be relieved a little bit. And the more we realize that, the better. And so I imagine, okay, I've learned all this stuff from smarter people than me. The Eden Alternative says things like this. Put your arm around that family member and maybe consider saying something like this. Hey, family member, your mom is doing fine, <laughs> you know? She doesn't need to go to all those groups you think to. Us, we can't make people do what they don't want to do. And then maybe say something like, but how are you doing? How are you really doing? See that support group idea, that support idea. It's hard to have someone you love live in a nursing home. How are you doing with that? Let's talk about that. How can we help, you know? So it's just a thing. It's true. Now, here's another fun idea from me to you. I call it filling in the gap. Uh, and what I'm getting at here is, <laughs> have any of you noticed, in, in, in our typical assessment process, we do not learn everything about a person that maybe we should. <laughs> has anyone found that to be true? And the, the big example I tend to use is this one. See if it's true for you. Have you ever served a person who actually got on the floor on purpose? And it took a while to, to figure out they were getting down there on purpose. And, you know, some people might get down there to pray. Some people like to sit on the floor. Asian cultures tend to sit on the floor more. And after hearing story after story, well, actually, she got on the floor. She didn't fall. It just became my example. Like, you know, that kind of proof that our assessment process or forms fail us, I think. And certainly there's a lot more details about people's lives, you know, on most of our forms. And so how can you find them out? Well, I got a real easy idea for you. How about no form, first of all? How do you like that? <laughs> no, I, I vote for no extra forms. Anybody else? <laughs> no new forms. Nope. I am not going to suggest more forms. Um, so without using a form, uh, you could... Um, Okay, bear with me. Let me tell you where this idea comes from. A friend of mine, Kim, took care of her mother in her home for many years. And then the day came that she needed more help and moved to an assisted living. My friend, Kim, being in this field, just naturally wrote down her mom's care plan. You know, if you're going to take care of my mom, you need to know a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> and that's where I get this idea. What if you asked family, and I don't want to dismiss the person. You could even ask the new, the person who's moving in, if they're able to write it down or tell you and you write it down. But if they're not able, then to ask the family. And I contend that that will fill in the gap. That will fill in a lot of gaps. You could also consider just having lunch with people, have coffee with people. How would you and I get to know each other if we were just getting to know each other. So um, <laughs> Julie says we've had several people who choose to get on the floor and we just make sure they're they're comfortable and it's on the care plan. Love it, Julie. Thank you. Love it, love it, love it. 
Uh, so get to know people better, have coffee, uh, ask them for all the details, you know, and notice how it might alleviate someone's guilt to write it all down. Oh, oh, the pillow, the pillow between the legs. Oh, um, this, that. My, my mother-in-law panicked one day. Her, her mother in her 90s was in, a, in rehab and, and she said this. Oh my gosh, I forgot to tell him. Mom needs a pillow between her legs. <laughs> you see, they think about these things, worry about these things. Okay, I would like to show you a couple regulations here. They're so good. Isn't it wonderful that the CMS federal regs are actually very good? So we are to treat people with respect and dignity. We are to enhance their quality of life. We are to recognize each person's individuality. Aren't those powerful words, guys? Bring those words up more with your team, would you? Pass them around, quiz each other, challenge each other. How are we doing on quality of life? Nursing homes aren't famous for quality of life, but they could be. You could be, guys. Go get famous for quality of life. That's what people want, right? And then it says that you must protect and promote the rights of the residents. Now, I'd like you to think about this. The, those words are new. And by new, I mean when these the latest rendition of regs came out, the, the big shift was 2016. And this language was added. And who can guess why? Why did CMS add <laughs> that we must protect and even promote people's rights? <laughs> I find that interesting. It sort of feels like to me, CMS is saying, hey, you guys, you're good at giving them a copy. You're good at posting a copy. And you're good at talking about one at resident council. But to protect and pr even promote. So do it, guys. Do it. Don't be afraid of this. Don't, don't wait for the ombudsman to come and protect and promote rights, right? And then watch this, here's how families come in. Look at this, CMS also added, the resident's wishes and preferences must be considered in the exercise of rights by the representative. Ooh, who's that? Family. And the regs go into this, that, that, that's whoever the person is, whether it's a legal rep or the family. Um, <laughs> they, that person is supposed to consider the exercise of rights by the resident, the resident's wishes and preferences. So what do you read between the lines there? Families, you can't make people go to activities, right? <laughs> Families, you can't make your mom take all those vitamins you might want her to take. So I love that. It's so good and interesting, isn't it, that that was added. And, and then I have a suggestion on that note. And that simply is what I call reframe the question. So this might sound rude, but what do you think of this? I recommend you don't ask family members what they want. No, don't ever ask a family member, what do you want, family member? It's not the right question. Always reframe it to the person. Hey, family member, how did your mom live with her diabetes all these years? Hey, daughter, what did your mom do when it was dessert time as living with the diabetes? Hey, daughter, what has your mom said about her diabetes? What, what have her goals been about her diabetes? What would your mom want? What would your mom say? So if you can think of reframing it always to the person, uh, um, I think that's powerful and it might help all of us. Uh, another fun idea for me to you uh, with families is to create what I call a culture of expectancy. Now, here's where this idea comes from. I've never had my child in a charter school, but what I've heard about charter schools is if you sign up, you have to commit as parents to uh, doing so many hours of volunteer work. And I've, I've always, I don't know why, it just hit me like, hey, what if we did something like that in the nursing home? Wouldn't that be cool? Um, uh, what if we said, I mean, we can't make people do stuff. Like, I wish we could say, and we need you to volunteer. 
so many hours per month. You could try it. Come on. Um, but what what I wanted to kind of apply this to was was um the room. Now that sounds funny, but you know how you all say you're welcome to decorate the room as you wish? Uh you all say that, people know that. But what if you had a little bit more oomph or more expectancy? If it were me, I would have explore this idea hey family member you know you know your mom your whole life and now we're just starting to get to know her we need your help your help for us to get to know your mom better and quicker and one idea would be to help decorate the room full of effects that teach us about her so pictures with maybe even a label this is when mom lived in germany or whatever um, more and more and more of things that help represent her and her life. Photos for sure, maybe artifacts. And you know, I just want to toss it out there. Curio cabinets that lock are a lovely way to help people have artifacts of their lives around them. But this idea of, of more of an expectancy, or you could even talk the language that we, we, in our culture, it's very important that we are partners. So we expect you to act like a partner. And we will too. We're not in charge. We're all equal partners in care of this person, like we talked about with that language. And speaking of the room, um, I just wanted to show you uh, photos I have of rooms that kind of depict this idea that, wow, you can learn a lot about this person from their room. So I took this picture in 2001. So you'll see some outdated <laughs> wallpaper on the top of the walls there. But uh, a lot of things here about this home. This home was doing a lot of culture change. So people were flying in and out to see it. And uh, right here, they would say to someone new, you are welcome to pick your own drapes and wallpaper and paint or, or leave it as it is. <laughs> And most people would say, well, it's fine as it is. And so the administrator shared with us that they gave choice, they offered choice, but rarely did people even take it. I find that fascinating. Uh, and then they, they've made a deep commitment for people to have their own things and their own furniture. Notice the bed, the bed frame. You don't see that in most nursing homes, and this is a nursing home. And they committed to keeping things flame retardant if they had to. So if, if an older piece of furniture comes in, the nursing home applies a flame retardant spray or something. And then they commit and keep track that it needs to be done every so often, like six months or something. They keep up with the product that they use. I just think that is marvelous. How about you? So now the person has their very own bed and a lot of their effects on the wall there. Uh, by the way, even though the tag calls it home-like, that is old, old, outdated, untrue language. We are trying to create home for people. This is their home. And the more we say home and get to home, the better, not home-like. <laughs> How many of you want to live in a home-like environment, whatever that is? And the reg also says the person should be able to use their personal belongings to the extent possible. And so this is the same room and it may look a little messy, but it really, it really shows this person. I love these photos. Um, nothing was really too cluttery. We, we sometimes claim clutter, you know, but the magazines are up against the wall. Um, I love when someone has their own refrigerator. I'm going to want one. How about you? Um, and look how she has her own, her fan, her clock, her TV, her plants, her fish. Oh, so many things. That I think that could be our goal. Now, maybe not everyone wants all that, of course. But what if we place more of an expectancy on people to bring their effects to really love where they live now and have everything around them that they need and want. And we learn who the person is. Um, this is kind of neat for me. In, in the beginning of my culture change journey about 30 years ago, uh, a leader in the movement would make this point that most nursing homes are the 
rooms look the opposite of this. I should pull up a very stark picture. And you often only see what's wrong with the person. You see the wheelchair, you see the oxygen tank, you see what's wrong with them. And can any of you see in, in one of these two pictures, there's something medical. Do any of you see it? And would you please tell me what it is, either in the chat or feel free to unmute. What is medical in, in one of these photos? Carmen, would it be the breathing treatment on the photo on the left? Yes, Patty, thank you. So this is the point. The uh, nebulizer, I guess, there, you, it, you don't only see what's wrong with the person. Isn't that great? It really, would you say it blends in? It took a minute to find it. Nancy, you found the nebulizer too. But you notice the point there. You don't only see what's wrong with the person. I just love that. Um, and you, you get the point. Okay, now, what's it like to be a family member? Have any of you been a family member to someone who lives in a nursing home? Feel free to unmute if so, or tell me in the chat. You know, imagine being one. It's got to be hard. <laughs> Let's just face it, very hard. And Brittany articulated a little bit ago, how free do people feel to share with you things that aren't going right? Even though you do hear it and we start to label those people as complainers, which I recommend not doing, they're somewhat brave, I'm afraid to say. And how many people are not brave to tell you what's not right? So all the more reason to um, really tell, want to know what's wrong, to know what could be better. Once you read, I'm calling you then <laughs> the state ombudsman or the state survey agency. So Joanne, you had your grandmother and Patty, you had your grandfather in the nursing home. You were family members. So I'd love to know if from that part of your life story, um, as a family member, was there anything you learned in that role that causes you to now do things differently or interact with families differently or anything like that? Feel free to unmute or tell in the chat box or think on it. Um, from that, I just wanna say, consider being more proactive. Have a proactive coffee culture is how I think of it. Go after what's wrong. Go after what could be better. Think of them as informants, not complainers. Uh, think of them as partners, not the difficult family member. Be honest. Um, ask a lot of questions. Uh, you know, teach everybody. Reflect that it's the resident we serve. Uh, focuses on the resident, the resident, the resident. Shani and Julie are from the legacy. The Legacy and Gillette, everyone did one of those word, help me, word doodles or something. We all get to put in words, you know, and then the top word gets bigger and bigger. And they did this with their team. And the word that represents their culture is the resident. I just love that. And so now they refer to that when there's a problem or we need to make a change or we're thinking about things. How do we make it so that the people who live here are the number one thing. Isn't that cool? And that is in reference to families too. The number one thing is the resident, not the families. Now that's no disrespect to families, but we have to reframe, like I said before, family member, what does your mom want? What does your mom think? What would your mom's goals be? What would your mom say her goals are if we, if she was able to tell us? Um, so now, I contend that we perhaps need to give families ideas of things to do so the visit is not just a check mark. Um, and my biggest thing would be encourage them to help people get outside. Perhaps you don't have the time to get people outdoors as much as you wish you did. That is often the case. So when families do come, 
what a wonderful thing to really encourage them to do for the fresh air, sunshine, vitamin D, etc. cetera. Uh, jo Joanne shared, our family does everything as a loud, crazy group. We celebrated her when she died. <laughs> we celebrated her the week she died. Some staff were uncomfortable with the mood we were in. We had to educate them about the different family cultures for life events. Beautiful. Thank you, Joanne. Very important. We all deal with these things differently. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I might also give the idea, you guys, for you to give families the idea to help these older people sign cards for the grandkids, to write letters, to write a letter for high school graduation, college graduation that I may or may not be at, right? Talk about meaningful. Give them really super duper meaningful ideas. This is my friend Glenna who created a beautiful book about her mother's life. And over the years, she kept track of stories and so she she typed up parts of Doris's life. And now Doris, who's a 90-some-year-old woman, doesn't remember everything. So she reads about her life. And it is glorious. What a gift, everybody. Encourage families to write people's stories and to add photos. And it gives such a wonderful thing to do to review the person's life together. Uh, maybe even bring the box of photos if you haven't done this yet and start to take the notes and encourage the families. Bring photos, bring a notebook, take notes, see what comes out of your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, even with the dementia, because sometimes people have real moments of lucidity. Maybe you can also encourage families to help this older person to develop their life story or to leave a legacy, write a book, write the story of their life. Bring a special artifact with with you for if, if you don't want to leave it, just bring it with, have an, something to do. Um, on that note, I worked with a team on a year-long project. I call it Proactive Practices to Prevent Falls. And one of the points, one of the month topics is engagement, meaningful engagement, because it might actually prevent falls as well. And we invited family members to help us do this. And apparently a nephew of a woman living at the nursing home had been a teacher. So he really got into this idea of engaging people more to prevent falls. And so he would bring a special like hat. He'd wear a special hat every time he came to create conversation and engagement. Isn't that fun? I love it. Uh, I think we can encourage families to be the ones to find the music that mom loves that would actually sing to, or dad, is it a radio? Is it CD? Is it a playlist? <laughs> you know, what is it um, for this older person? Help us figure it out, set it on the station or get the playlist or whatever. Uh, I mentioned maybe giving families a volunteer opportunity to do with their person, um, with mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, when they're in the nursing home. Um, love that. So even if the older person can't really do the volunteer work and the other person does, so be it. I've seen a couple have a job to set up communion I mentioned earlier. Um, keep on them to, to ha put it on them to help you get to know this person better. Here's another similar example. Um, this woman, Manda, had worked at a logging camp most of her life and was famous for her caramel rolls. <laughs> Can I tell you something funny? Someone must have misheard it once because they actually call them Carmen rolls, which is so ironic. I, I never knew this person, but I talk a lot about her. And so the, this was a nursing home that happened to be the household model, like St. John's in Jackson Hole. And so they have kitchens in each house. It's actually a household. They're all connected, different than greenhouses. And the point here was they supported her to continue to make her caramel rolls. I see it like continue to be famous. And we even turned this into an artifact of culture change where you all, if whether you have a kitchen like a household or a greenhouse or a rehab apartment, most of you have that, or an activity kitchen, 
is available for residents and families to cook and bake, and the home intentionally notifies residents and families of its availability. Um, Amy Holt is doing this, and they just have a sign-up sheet, and therapists sign up just like families would sign up. And I heard the story that even though a mother passed away, the daughter came and and went into the therapy kitchen to bake something with the roommate of her, her mother. Isn't that neat? Uh, another artifact that is kind of fitting, the home recruits family members and outside community members as volunteers. I'm guessing you all could use some volunteers. I would say create a list. I, if I was an administrator, I would ask my team, every single one, to create a list of volunteer jobs in their team. I'm not saying department. Everybody has something a volunteer could do. And certainly you could share this with people who live there as well. Um, but maybe recruiting and letting people know your volunteer opportunities. I found this uh, actually from our guest speaker. Some of you maybe uh, were with us in, uh, help me, Lander, August 11th. Um, my colleague, Linda uh, Shell, shared this. Family members can fill important roles when there's shortages. Yes, <laughs> I say use them as volunteers as much as you can. I, I heard stories through COVID, did you hear this? Where family members got a job at the nursing home so they could get in there and see uh, someone they love. Uh, communication is essential. Of course, I hope you take that so seriously. Families improve social connections, paid caregivers cannot. True, just true. And trusting and collaborative relationships actually improve your quality. See, they're an informant. They're a quality assurance person when they're telling you what's not right. And then another research said this, residents that met their desire for visitors were more likely to have satisfaction with their life, um, increased psychosocial outcomes on the part of residents from family involvement, lower risk of infection and hospitalization. That's interesting to me. Do any of you get that? Is it because you're just higher level of well-being and then improved well-being for the family members as well? Wonderful. And then have any of you heard of relational coordination or relational care? Oh, it just makes sense. This is common sense. So a high quality relationship makes it a priority to share knowledge, to actually identify goals together, wow, and a very high mutual respect. And then the high quality interactions are something we just heard, frequent communication, <laughs> communicating very timely, real time, I'd call it, accurately, and there's a problem solving focus instead of a blaming focus. And then um, all of this uh, leads to better satisfaction from the customer, performing, performing higher quality from those of us working there, uh, even quantity, wow, and then employee well-being and employee resilience. Relational coordination, treating people like people, common sense, right? And maybe, you know, take whatever you're hearing today to your whole wider team and ask them all to think about what could we do different with families? How could we honor families? Here's a few ideas I heard. What are your ideas? That's the Coopy culture. Um, so that is what I had for you today. Uh, could I hear from you all? What are, what are some things you do with families? Or Patty, you see home doing with families. That's really impressive. Could I hear some ideas today, please? Maybe from each of you, whether where you work now or you have work or even just an idea you have. We have time. I'd love to hear from each of you, please, if I could. Just anything. Carmen. Yes. This is Danny. Danny. I don't think it's anything groundbreaking or new, but we definitely invite families to events 
So we usually have a Mother's Day prom every year, um, you know, and we do pretty regularly some sort of get together um, and, and families are always invited to that kind of stuff. Beautiful. Thank you, Shani. I'm not sure this is what you're looking for, Carmen, but when when we talk to family members, a lot of times we can tell by the way they're talking that it's it's what they want. Um, and and so we try to to ask them, well, you know, what would your mother want? What would your father want? Um, you know, did did they like doing that when they were younger? I'm trying to get them back to the to the focus on, on the resident and not what they think the resident should be doing or should have, or, you know, should be. So that's what we try to do with families. And most of the time they're very cooperative. And um, we don't, we don't have any Good. issues with that, but sometimes they're a little stubborn. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Patty. I appreciate that. That's still a thing, right? And you got to reframe them and thank you that you are. Yeah. That's great. Really good. Hey, Joanne or James or Nancy, Julie. I'd love to hear something. Any best practices you all have seen with families or just thought about? Uh, Joanne shares, we struggle sometimes educating spouses <laughs> about resident preferences. So kind of the same story there, uh, but specifically spouses. Yeah. See how hard that must be. A spouse loves this person dearly, <laughs> typically wants the best for them. But sometimes, you know, we also, what's that word uh, when we put on people what we think? project right like oh don't let them have it'll be tricky when we all are there uh while you're still thinking everyone could you please also give me in the chat box your knowledge about all this today before and your knowledge after i really need it for the grant if you all could help me with that please it's okay for your wife to eat her dessert first that's right. That's right, Joanne. You're so much fun. I love it. It is okay. Uh, back to Wyoming, everyone. Our grant is going to be over into March. So I'd love to ask each of you to help us. We have some big audacious goals that every person working in a nursing home in Wyoming receives training on culture change. These are recorded. The The recording has a better attendance than live which is fine and that's great and good news and we also have a crazy goal that every person who lives in a nursing home in wyoming sleeps until they wake up naturally and i'm proud to say that many of the the homes that i got to work with i worked with five homes per year most of them do not wake people up anymore isn't that great so it's not all homes but you know it's some, and you don't have that many homes anyway. So maybe a low percentage is, is a pretty good statistic, right? Uh, uh, and we have five amazing videos capturing the story of Star Valley. They were in year one. They implemented um, 12 practices in one year. And guess what? Like unbeknownst to me, they kept going and they, they implemented 12 more the next year on their own isn't that cool so go watch their video life care of casper was in the project for a year and a half and they did a lot of practices as well and i mentioned they opened up lots of opportunities for um, people who live there to volunteer they have a continental breakfast they don't wake people up so many good things there westward heights was in a, exactly year two and to be honest, they got the most amazing outcomes. If you watch any of them, 
watch Westward Heights because it will inspire you. They had no weight loss for the first time in seven years. Skin improves, falls decreased. Uh, people like coming to work because they made it more efficient about the people who live there and not stupid tasks just to do a task. Uh, they needed less med pack time. They need less CNA time at night. They needed less overtime. They don't do bonuses anymore. And the last I heard, they have no job openings. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Mission at Castle Rock and Morningstar have both been a part of the Eden Alternative for many years. And they too have amazing cultures. And they don't wake people up. And I highly recommend them as well. Uh, I, I kind of like saying this. I hope it's okay. Consider watching these at home with your family uh, because everyone of all ages, I think, needs to learn that living in a nursing home could be terrific. Maybe it will draw people to, to our profession. Um, so please consider their one hour movies kind of documentaries that anyone and, and everyone are invited to watch. Uh, please join me next month, November 17th, and we will be doing the topic, going deeper into the details of individuals' lives. Um, and then we just have four more after that. The last one in March will be the, the journeys of the teams I'm working with. Legacy, you're on the line. Polaris, you're on the line today. Amy Holt, you're on the line. And they will be sharing their journeys in this third year. It's going to be great. Um, and then Wyoming, uh, the coalition plans to keep going. If any of you want to be a part of it, uh, many hands make less work. And, and whoever you are, wherever you work, I just love inviting you to, to consider becoming a culture change advocate. Uh, we need more people to speak loudly on changing institutional culture. Um, we really do. So do any of you happen to have any last questions for me or big ideas or anything you want to talk about? Maybe not. Thank you all for being here today. Have a great weekend. Don't get sick. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye, Carmen. Bye, everybody. Bye, Patty. Thanks for coming. Sorry, I was late. Oh, we forgive you, silly. You're our Cheyenne, our our Cheyenne, um, um, regional ombudsman position is vacant, um, mm -hmm. and so I'm trying to do that mm -hmm. job and my job, and mm -hmm. gotcha. so it's been well, crazy today. So, yeah. well, thanks for being here, Patty. I mean it. it means a lot. Oh, no no problem. With all Thank that you. going on. Thanks for your support. You bet. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you all.